If people remember anything from high school Western Civ, it's that in the Middle Ages, the church ruled life. And by modern standards, that seems true enough. But was it really? Let's delve into the fictional 13th century town of Greymantle to see. Today, faith tends to focus on the individual, a person's own relationship with God. But the 13th century was a very different, much more hierarchical world. That hierarchy started at the top. Monarchs of Europe claimed that the authority to rule came directly from God, the Roman Catholic Christian God. That authority then permeated down through all levels of society. In that regard, medieval Europe and Catholicism were two sides of the same coin. As part of the rigid hierarchy of the age, access to the Bible and its religious mysteries, all written and spoken in Latin, was limited to the priests and elites. Regular folks were shut out from being able to study the faith. That was the domain of the clergy alone. In 13th century Greymantle, this meant that the priest bore the responsibility for the town's souls. A priest's job was less about ministering and teaching, and more about performing the right rituals in the right way. The shepherd communicating with God on behalf of his flock. Townspeople weren't required to attend Mass, and the priest felt no need to engage those who did. The only requirements for a proclaimed Christian were to take communion and to confess sins once a year. Parishioners expected to tend to their worldly business, while the priest looked after their spiritual selves. That's not to say that individual faith was unimportant. Milestones like birth and death were enveloped in Christian ritual. Sundays and feast days were a chance to rest from hard labor and think about the hereafter. And in an age when few could read and science was still limited, faith was the guidepost for handling life's ups and downs. It was just a faith that was more walled off from its sources than today. So how did Christianity look in Greymantle? Well, it started, reasonably enough, at the church. The best-built, most impressive building in any given town was probably its church. The inside of a medieval church would be both familiar and strange to modern eyes. For one thing, 13th century churches didn't have chairs or pews. During Mass, people would stand, and were free to walk about, and even hold quiet conversations with each other. The key ingredients to a medieval parish church were the high altar, the screen above it, which could be lowered to shield the priest during parts of the service, the confessional, and the baptismal font, which was usually ancient, sometimes even a repurposed Roman altar. The space outside the church was also used differently than it is today. Weddings would be performed on the church steps to a standing crowd of well-wishers. Traveling friars would make impassioned sermons, while partners sold indulgences nearby. And don't be surprised by the market stalls you see set up on Greymantle's church green. Even the interior of a medieval church could be used as a market during off hours. And if the cemetery looks like it was too small to contain all the dead of a centuries-old town, it was. A body was allowed to lie in the ground for only about ten years. Then the bones were dug up and moved to the crypt, or ossuary. This consecrated space was intended to be the townsfolk's final resting place, a jumbled mass of thousands of bones. Only the very elite got permanent tombs when they died, where their bodies could lie undisturbed. Just as today, keeping a medieval church in good order was expensive. Payment came from the tithe, the donations and taxes given to a parish by its parishioners. The word tithe means one-tenth, but the amount actually given varied widely from town to town and person to person. In the countryside, tithes could be foodstuffs or maybe wool or building materials. For an urban church, tithing more often involved cash or labor. At Greymantle, the money went toward upkeep of the church, as well as paying for the priest's own personal home, the parsonage. As he tended to the town's spiritual life, the town repaid by tending to his earthly life. Greymantle's parsonage is well built and well sited, but not gaudy. Its priest has a comfortable but austere life, with his food, clothing, and housework taken care of. The priest of a town of 1,000 people needed helpers. 
In Grey Mantle, I've made room for three conspicuous examples, the Beetle, the Sacristan, and the Almoner. The Beetle is an administrator and a people manager. He keeps records on church accounts, what's owed, what's paid. He keeps up with the town news, scheduling weddings, baptisms, funerals. And he maintains order at services, taking on the roles of usher and church warden. The sacristan is responsible for the physical objects involved in Christianity. The priest's robes, communion wafers, holy water, Bibles, relics. He makes sure everything is ready for each service, and makes sure valuable items are locked and secured when not in use. In Greymantle, the beetle and sacristan live in something of a communal hostel, which I've called the chapel dorm. It's a good base of operations for maintaining the Beatles' ledger books and the sacristan's precious church possessions. It also provides sleeping and washing space for visiting friars and other low- to mid-level church officials on their travels. Lastly, its basement acts as a storehouse to hold alms. Just as people were asked to give 10% of their earnings to the church, the church was compelled to give at least 10% of its possessions to the needy, mostly in the form of foodstuffs. Because of this, the town almoner and his helpers are frequent visitors to the chapel dorm. The almoner runs the almshouse, located in the far northwestern corner of Greymantle. Poor folk in town come daily for a bowl of porridge or loaf of bread. A few bunk beds are provided as temporary rest for the homeless or the wanderers. The poor and outcast who live in hamlets or in the forest also gather daily at Almsgate for their share. Built low, the small, narrow doorway of Almsgate was originally intended to make the almoner stoop and show humility in front of those he fed. However, times have changed. The new almoner stays inside the town walls. Now it's the poor who come in through the door, and it's they who do the stooping. Few people love the almoner. The last main example of Christianity at Greymantle is up in the castle grounds. The Lord and Lady of the castle have their own private chapel, with a personal chaplain who looks after their souls. The Lord is a pious man, relatively speaking, and takes his faith and his duties seriously. He can often be found in the chapel, looking for guidance on the decisions of the day. So that winds up this brief tour of the religious life of 13th century Greymantle. This was an age in which the church's influence ran deep and faith was strong, but it was also a time of learning, questioning, and growth. The same hierarchy that made sharp distinctions between earthly and spiritual gave space for both to blossom. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If so, please consider hitting the like button and leave a message in the comments below. Thanks for watching.